Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us on NTV Uganda. We occupy your Sunday afternoon with an interesting conversation on the investment climate in Uganda post-COVID or during COVID, should we say. I have with me a, a very eminent panel of individuals to discuss this topic. I don't think I deserve to introduce them, so I'll let each of them introduce themselves. But I'm also going to just make a request to them that we can take off the masks from inside the studio so that we'll talk to each other. And after the conversation is done, we'll put back the masks. Have the, the studio is corona free yes we <laughs> disinfected the studio before you got here okay thank you so <coughs> much thank you uh, and, and I, w I want to start with you honorable minister to introduce yourself uh, and make some opening remarks and then we can take uh, the rest thank you very much raymond my name is anita mm. evelyn mm. uh, the minister of state for finance in charge investment and privatization mm. uh, i want to first of all thank uh uganda investment authority mm. and ntv and also the private sector for, the re for being resilient during this difficult time of coronavirus. Mm. And also Ugandans for cooperating with all of us mm. uh, to ensure that we do not register death in this country. And mm. most importantly, thank His Excellency Yori Kaguta Museveni for all the guidance and mm. support that he's given to us as a country. Mm. Thank you so much. Uh, and when you mention His Excellency, I know someone sits on his presidential roundtable of investors. Uh, Mahmoud, you can now introduce yourself. Thanks, Raymond. Mm. Uh, my name is Mahmoud Hora, and I uh, chair the Agricultural Value Additional Technical Working Committee for the President Investors uh, Roundtable. And I'd like to take this opportunity to really applaud the government in its response to COVID-19 and the way that it has come out and the way we have come out of the whole situation with just uh, a few hundred cases compared to a few hundred thousand cases mm -hmm. all over the world. So mm -hmm. congratulations to the government and uh, congratulations also to the media on the way that they have uh, brought the news out to the public and the awareness out to the public. Mm -hmm. Well done. Thank you so much uh, for, for that. And now I know many of the economists in the country come from only one place. <laughs> this is the uh, thank you, thank mm. you very much. Uh, uh, our viewers, I am Waswan Balunyo, presently the head of the business school at Makere University. And I'd like to thank Uganda Investment Authority for the arrangement, uh, for partnering with us, and also NTV for being the host. I'd like to welcome my colleagues, uh, mm. my sister Anite and uh, Mahmoud, Mahmoud on this uh, panel this, this evening. Thank you so much. Of course, uh, some people are joining us uh, <coughs> online, and I, I want to take this opportunity for Professor Pamela to introduce herself. Um, Professor Pamela, if you hear us, um, this is now the time to tell us who you are or what you do. Thank you, moderator. My name is Pamela Mbabazi. I'm the chairperson, National Planning Authority, and I'd like to add my voice in extending my sincere appreciation to Uganda Investment Authority and the collaborative partners for putting together this e-conference in enabling us as Ugandans, as partners to come together and discuss, debate, engage, and see how together as a country, really, we, re we want to push um, our nation forwards. And I'd also like to thank and add my voice in expressing my sincere appreciation to His Excellency and government for giving us the much needed leadership in dealing with uh, COVID-19. It is a uh, very new territory as a country and as a globe that we've entered with this pandemic. But if we can continue to discuss, share ideas, debate, work together to see how we overcome, then we will make it. I thank you. Thank you so much. We also have Alex Asimwe from the Ministry of Gender joining us from the studio. If you hear me, Alex, now's the time to introduce yourself too. Hello, Raymond. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, hello, viewers. I uh, would like to thank uh, NTV and Uganda Investment Authority for organizing this uh, good initiative. And uh, I would also like to extend uh, my appreciation to all Ugandans and uh, particularly the President of the President of the Republic of this country for really for giving us a uh, robust leadership in uh, ensuring that uh, we not only uh, prevent but also we control this pandemic that uh, is uh, affecting the entire globe. Thank you. 
All right, thank you so much. We will later be joined by Mr. Lawrence Biancy, who is the Acting Director General for the Uganda Investment Authority. But I want us now to start the conversation, and I'll start with you, Evelyn Aniti. Uh, all across the globe, we're being told that investments are scaling down. We're being told that the economies are coming, or they're tumbling, or reducing. What would you say is the status of investment in Uganda during this COVID-19 pandemic? Um, I must say that it's actually not very true that mm. the, the economy is going to be affected so badly mm. all round. Um, some sectors of economy, of, yes, are going to be affected, and some mm. will not be affected, certainly. And some of those that will be affected will be tourism, mm. and already see the effect. Um, so many hotels are actually empty and closed. They've laid off their staffs, both in Kampala and upcountry, I know. So that sector has been affected. So the tourism sector and the hotel sector has been affected. Um, the other sector that I think that would not be so badly hit because the investors have had to rethink their strategies of um, manufacturing is the manufacturing sector, clearly, mm -hmm. the industrialization sector. Now, why it has not, been, it has not affected us so much <coughs> is because of the leadership. Now, I want to tell you that when I had that 4,200 factories had closed, I actually had, as the supervisor of Uganda Investment Authority, I had to ask them to commission a survey. And they did the survey, and uh, the acting executive director will be able to speak to that survey, mm. and um, they'll tell you exactly their findings. And someone like me, who is not just an officer or a minister who sits in office, I've gone to the field, and I have also done my own survey. Mm -hmm. So there, is, there are positive things that have happened. And I want to tell you, it all boils down to the issue of leadership. So with the SOPs that His Excellency, the President, put in place, and the support that he gave to the manufacturing sector, the sector is actually thriving. Yes, some factories have scaled down, or mm -hmm. downsized on their workers. But some <coughs> factories have had to remodel. Now, when, we started th when this pandemic first started, we had a very big challenge. And the challenge we had was we did not know where to find sanitizers. Everyone was saying we have to sanitize our hands. Mm. And our president uh, directed me through cabinet that I have to talk to the manufacturers to see if we could make hand sanitizers available. So at the time, we only had one company that was manufacturing, that is Saraya, in Uganda and exporting it to the neighboring countries. So we, the first thinking was like, can we ask Saraya not to export? But the president said, no, let Saraya export, let's encourage other sectors. Now, people who are into the sectors of manufacturing liquor because mm -hmm. of the COVID, the liquor industry went down because people who are consuming alcohol could now not consume because the bars were closed. Mm. So what did we do? We called all the manufacturers of spirit, ethanol, and told them, and told them that they have to now invest in <coughs> manufacturing <coughs> sanitizers. Mm. Now I want to tell you, we gave them incentives, tax incentives, we gave them electricity, we gave them what they asked us to do for them to be able to establish these factories. Mm. I want to tell you at the time they told me the volume of liquor in the country was seven million liquor that they had, mm. ethanol, that yes. they had. And they converted the seven million. We now talk about 105 sanitizer factories. So they did not have to lay down their workers. Another classic example <coughs> is the textile. It was going to, s it, w it was affected. The textile, textile factory was affected. Mm. Now, when we brought the issue that we must buy 35 million community masks. And this was an opportunity. They had closed down. Yesterday, I visited one of the textile industries. 
they, before COVID, they had only 100 fine spinners. They only had 1,000 workers. Mm. But because of this opportunity of community masks, they have had to hire additional 500 workers. So that was an opportunity. And again, we only knew of three textile factories. Mm. And that is Southern Ranch Naito. Uh, we had um, fine spinners and Christex. But now we talk about over 33 garment factories. Now, what does that mean? As a country, we have been exporting our raw cotton to a tune of 54 million US dollars, mm -hmm. raw cotton. Now, if we give more support, which we have given, because for me as government, it's not if anymore, because under the leadership of the president, we have addressed the challenge that they've been facing, which is, which is uh, cheap access to cheap finance. Mm -hmm. That's why we put one trillion and it's not only one trillion, it's one trillion five hundred billion, and we've put it in UDB, so that they can give access it at an interest rate between twelve to five percent. The twelve between twelve to ten. Mm. Ten to twelve. Ten to twelve percent. Twelve yes. percent. Mm. And what does that mean? If we give them this opportunity to access this cheap financing, and we have this thirty three that we know, our cotton that we've been ex exporting raw to a tune mm. of 54, 54 million dollars, we'll be able to add the value on this cotton mm. here in Uganda, and we will export finished products like mm. this. You should know once upon a time, this comes from West Nile. Mm. My mom gave it to me. But I'll tell you, once upon a time, these were made in Uganda. As we speak in, in, Ke in, in, in DRC Congo, but now all of it is imported from China. So with this opportunity, that COVID has come, has brought mm. to us. If we invest and we have taken it serious, we'll be able to export 500 million worth of finished products mm. out of textile mm. alone. Thank, thank, thank you so much, Mr. Minister. And, and I, I will get back to this, but I, I wanted to, to bring in Professor uh, Pamela Mbabazi here, who is in charge of the planning, mostly because she's at the board of the, the National Planning Authority. Uh, wh what does your planning look like since COVID-19 happened. And I know that it happened when you just come to the tail end of the National Development Plan. Have you had a rethink of the National Development Plan? Thank you very much, moderator. And I'd like to thank the Honorable Minister for um, um, giving a broad picture of where we're standing now in, uh, in, with investments and opportunities that um, COVID-19 actually has brought um, to to, to light. But in as far as um, the planning, um, the National Development Plan uh, is concerned, uh, moderator, you're very right that by uh, before um, uh, the COVID-19 uh, came into play, we were almost done, almost launching the NDP3. And this was after a long consultative process uh, engaging Ugandans and all our partners agree on where as a country we want to focus for the next five years. And by and large, this broader goal, this broader strategy that we had all agreed on to achieve in the next five years has remained focused. But of course, the, um, with the coming of COVID, we've had to recast the plan and ensure that um, we make adjustments to take into consideration the challenges that have been posed uh, by COVID-19. So briefly, I wanted to highlight uh, for uh, our, view, our viewers what our initial focus and broadly the overview and aspirations of NDP3 um, were, but then come round um, to highlight what we have recast in light of COVID-19, in as far as investments and our aspirations for investments in Uganda are concerned. So uh, moderator, in terms of uh, the National Development Plan 3 aspiration, we still aspire, NDP3 aspires to build a modern, a people-centered, an independent, integrated, resilient, and self-sustaining economy. And to this end, 
NDP3 aims at increasing household incomes, we still want to focus and will continue to aim at increasing household incomes and ensure that we improve the quality of life of Ugandans through sustainable industrialization for inclusive growth, employment, and sustainable wealth creation. So our overall goal remains the same. And to this um, end, we have articulated the five key strategic objectives that will help us achieve our overall goal of improving household incomes and the quality of life of Uganda. And in this, we want, first of all, to enhance value addition in key growth opportunities. We don't want Uganda anymore to be selling primary products. We don't want Uganda to be selling raw cotton. The Honorable Minister was talking about um, the textile factories. And one of the things we want to focus on, especially um, you know, with the opportunities that COVID has brought, to support our investors to ensure we add value to our key commodities. The second objective is to strengthen our private sector to drive growth and create jobs. You, you heard from the Honorable Minister the number of jobs, even within these few months, that uh, one of our textile factories has been able to create. So the other uh, objective uh, in our NDP3 remains strengthening the private sector to drive growth and create jobs, consolidating and increasing the stock and quality of our productive infrastructure is our third uh, objective. And the fourth is increasing our productivity inclusiveness and well-being of the population, while our fifth is increasing the role of the state in development. We are saying the state has not, um, sorry, the state needs to come in and support and, and invest together in partnership or where uh, it, 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 it can do so uh, on its own to ensure that it invests in areas where the private sector has not invested. I'll give an example. We have been importing a lot of iron and steel. We have a lot of deposits in Mupo. We are saying in uh, going forwards, we must ensure that um, whether in partnership with the private sector or um, you know, as a state to get in and see how we can import substitute in some of these critical areas that will uh, promote growth. Um, and now to achieve these five objectives, we have also articulated the 20 uh, strategies, but also 18 uh, programs. And NDP3 will aim at harnessing both government, the private sector strength, and to strengthen Uganda's real economy by producing domestically uh, or locally all those goods and services that at least address the basic necessities of life. And when I talk about the basic necessities of life, I am um, prioritizing food, clothing, shelter, medicines, security, infrastructure, health, education, but of course, spirituality and services are also key. So we want to strategize on how Uganda will harness its abundant factors of production through a knowledge base of science and technology. We want to ensure we do research and development and science and technology are key to enable us improve the livelihoods of our citizens. But also around all this, our main um, you know, driving uh, strategies, export promotion, but also import substitution, so that we produce for the domestic, for the region, but also for international markets, goods and services from uh, Uganda. And we want to ensure that in all this, the private sector is key. So broadly speaking, really, um, the, the NDP uh, is essentially focused on improving the quality of life of Ugandans, but using the strategy of import uh, substitution and export promotion. Now, in light of, of COVID-19 on investments, NDP aspirations will remain uh, important, even with COVID-19. Indeed. The importance of nurturing and strengthening the private sector is more pronounced now than ever before. And the immediate impact of COVID-19 really has been to disrupt investments, particularly private investments, as, as the minister pointed out. And the private investment, uh, as, the service, as, the, as your survey actually uh, by UIA has shown, 
has, have, have really fallen uh, in the country. For instance, some of the businesses, as you indicated, might close. And the effect of a lockdown has also been harsh on agriculture, on manufacturing, um, on services to a varying degree. But the largest hit has been uh, medium and small enterprises. All right. Uh, so pro Professor Pamela, I, I just wanted to interrupt you there. And, and uh, of course, what, a lot of what you're saying is music to Mahmoud's ears. That's why I want to bring him here. Because uh, in either way, the private sector really is the engine. When you hear the minister, uh, Anite, when you hear a professor speaking, the private sector is really the engine. Are you prepared as the private sector to shoulder this economy? And if you aren't prepared, what are those things that you'd say the private sector needs to be the engine for the economy during COVID-19 and after COVID-19? Thanks, Raymond. I think uh, Honorable uh, Anite brought it up really well. And Pamela also alluded to it. Is we have a very resilient economy, okay? And that resilience is because you also have a resilient private sector. The example that the Honorable uh, had mentioned in the liquor sector, transforming into hand sanitizers, that's an example of the resilience. And I believe that we will be able to step up to the plate. And I'm using the word I believe because the, the question you're going to ask then is, is what do we need? Okay. Um, we are looking in the budget speech that was read and what the NDP3 uh, objectives are is looking at import substitution and is looking at export promotion. But both of those two will require two things, competitiveness and quality. Now, in order to get the two, competitiveness and quality, in the quality side, we're going to really need to look at skilling. We're going to really need to look at education. We're really going to need to look at technology. This is very, very, very key. It's not just about, all right, I've got $1.5 trillion sitting at UDB. How do I deploy that money efficiently, effectively, to get a quality product out at a quality price? That is going to be the key to import substitution. I'll give you an example. Take tomato ketchup. Value addition, everybody talks about tomato ketchup. Today, Uganda produces tomatoes at about two to three kilos per square meter. You have Egypt, China, and Italy producing tomatoes at 70 kilos per square meter. Now, there is no way we are going to be able to get value addition or agro-processing if we are not competitive. And the only way to get competitiveness is through skilling and through technology. So the 1.5 trillion that's sitting at UDB, it's not just about finance. It's about human resources, human capacity in order to deploy that money properly. And the key word is private sector is resilient. Mm. But, and but we have that capability mm, to I, move I, forward. I'd want to stay with you. And, and the key question is government has taken broad risks in terms of skilling. This is the most educated generation in the history of the country. Um, when you look at the economy itself, you have a, a largely mixed economy where government plays a part, but the private sector has a, a very big role. So government would so somehow say, you know, we've done what we need to do. Now is your turn to do what you need to do. Do you already see these skills in the market that can compete? And if you see them, how are you identifying them and working with them? Okay. The skills are there in the market, but the skills are still not up to 100% scratch. So we're still going to need to import uh, expertise in order to bring us to that level, in order to make our products get quality, and to get price. Now, the second thing is going to be about price, because we also need economies of scale to run the factories to make their factories work in this manner. If I import bicycles from China because they're cheaper, even though you put a 60% tax on the bicycles, but even if they are cheaper after 60% and better quality, the Ugandan will go after the bicycle. So what do we need to do? We need to step up our play, step up our game on the skilling side. I still think we're behind. Even my own corporation, it, access to finance is one part of it. 
But the second part is if somebody asks me, Mahmoud, I want you to triple the exports out of your company, I would turn around and say, wow, okay, where am I going to get the people from? That's going to be the first question. Where am I going to get the skilled or the semi-skilled people to take me to that level? We're getting there slowly. Brick by brick, we're building it. Mm. But it's going to take time. Mm. And, and when you mention brick by brick, this is why I bring in Professor also. I, I want to start by asking you a philosophical question, and then we can come to the education question. We are in, in that stage where we're turning the economy from an agrarian economy into an industrialized economy. And it comes at a time when, sadly, a pandemic is before us. Um, the demand has been suppressed. The goods coming out of Mahmoud's factory, the people who are demanding them may not have the money to buy it. From just a philosophical perspective, is import substitution the right thing to do at the moment? And if it's the right thing, how should we do it? Well, I, I have had the idea of import substitution, and uh, I have been surprised because in strategy, on your drawing board, your competitor has a drawing board. And just like Mahmoud has said, if the people who are exporting into Uganda still find it much, I mean, they still make profit, still exporting despite our taxes imposed on, uh, on a product, we may fail to import substitute. Mm -hmm. I, I feel that right now the import substitution is a medium, is a short-term strategy, unless if we're able to really have our organizations competitive, as Mahmoud has said, we will not do it. Uh, it's surprising that you, we, we import drugs worth about 1.2 trillion shillings, mm -hmm. and uh, who is producing it locally? Because it's cheaper imported from India, from China. So uh, I think this is where I think I had Pamela talk about the role of government. Government has to sit down and select those areas where we think as a country we can grow competitiveness. We cannot simply do it across the board. The private sector is very funny. You, you know, market, market forces don't listen to anybody. They do what they feel is best. And the importers here will find ways of importing. You, you, you heard what has been happening in the URA. Uh, the, you know, the people who have left is because maybe they've been covering up people who pay taxes. So... Uh, I think government needs to sit down and decide what are the areas where we need to focus. Like where do we have the advantages, the mm -hmm. cotton areas, uh, the iron ore, which I heard from Pamela, we have a lot of iron ore. And we decide, can we then do the scaling, like we're doing with oil. There's, there's a lot of scaling going on with oil. The, the, the PSFU, Private Sector Foundation, is empowering various institutions to do scaling. So, yes, there is need for a deliberate decision on which areas we can compete in. And uh, a decision must be taken, who must do it. Mm. Well, but that, that sounds like a contradiction. Yes. If, if you urge government to yes. decide, yes. and yet you want the market forces to the also be the ones must that decide. decide there is no the way. Mm. There is no way weak countries like Uganda can leave everything to the market. We won't be able to, to succeed. Yes, we, sh we shall have economic growth, but you continue to see poverty on the street. What, what the coronavirus has done is reveal the various weaknesses in the economy. Uh, and they are so glaring. I'm surprised people don't see what they are. They are so glaring. We have a very weak economy. We have people who are very vulnerable. I mean, just two weeks, people can't feed themselves. It tells you a story about what the country and where the economy is. And if government does not take a deliberate decision, uh, if you look at Singapore, Japan, and uh, those southeastern countries, governments decided where shall we be in textiles, in electronics in the next five, ten years. That's what I'm talking about. And then open it up for the private sector. The Japanese government encourages competition within companies in Japan. But when it's export, they select who does it, who does it best. So we need to sit down as a country. Government must sit down. I think we have the investment minister here. Mm. We have UIA here. We have uh, the planning authority here. They must sit down and decide on where do we really decide to do import substitution.
Mm. Otherwise, we are going to have a war with Kenya over trade. If we lock out, you, you had the case of milk. Yes. You know, what was happening to milk? Mm. A very simple case. So we need to sit down and decide what we want to do in these areas. Mm. And in the areas of skilling, as Mount said, we are not yet there. Mm. We're, we're very, that's, very that's a passionate plea. And when you mention government, we have almost the entire government on this, this show at the moment. Yes. We have investment, we have planning, but I want us to bring in Alex Asimo, who is in the Commission for, for Productivity, Labor Productivity, particularly at Gender, Labor and Social Development. You've been listening to us, Alex, and, and I want you to come in here now. How more productive can the Ugandan skill market get? And, and what is the ministry doing to make that the Ugandan become productive and, and also to skill them in a way that Mahmoud can take advantage of them? So, uh, Raymond, uh, first of all, we need to understand that uh, there are a number of factors that uh, affect productivity and uh, also uh, interventions that enhance productivity are multi-sectoral or what you would call multi-agency. Uh, but in particular, uh, the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development uh, has started robust interventions uh, and some interventions they have been ongoing uh, for some years and uh, we have seen some positive signs uh, in regard to uh, productive employment for our people. Now, the one of the key areas Apart from the fundamentals of the economy, which you definitely know, and the Honorable Minister talked about it, you know, security, infrastructure, you know, those fundamentals that actually um, enable uh, investors to do business with the minimum cost, th that, that aside alone, and the government, and as you know, has been putting a lot of emphasis in that, the ministry is looking at mindset work culture and ethics. And uh, you know, this is one of the greatest impediment uh, of our productive workforce. Uh, and some of our Ugandans that are not in the productive uh, category. So we have interventions uh, you have had that uh, cabinet uh, last year uh, passed or approved the Uganda National Apprenticeship Framework. Because apprenticeship framework is a, a, a mode of learning that is taken at the place of work. And this mode of learning is a very, very uh, vital in enhancing productivity because you have this person who really does not understand how an engine works, but is able to go into the garage, is taught how the engine works, and as being taught, is, is earning because he's working, and at the end of a uh, learning period, uh, after achieving the learning outcome, is satisfied and accredited. So this model of, of skilling is the one that we now see that is going to help us to feed what you call a mismatch, skills mismatch, that gap that we have been having. Uh, secondly, the ministry you know very well, uh, apart from skills, and uh, you, uh, Raymond, you know it very well, that uh, not every country that has a skilled uh, manpower is productive or has investment. Because if it was like that, then uh, countries like uh, uh, Spain and Portugal would be okay because they have skilled uh, manpower. So the issue of access to finance, and as you know, we had a two serious programs, the Youth Livelihood Program and the Women Entrepreneurship Program. Uh, these two programs have been providing uh, funds to women groups and youth groups. And currently, over 500,000 youth have benefited, over 200,000 women have benefited from these programs and have created jobs. So those are very, very serious programs. In addition, uh, because we pursue what we call um, an inclusive growth, and I'm sure somebody from NPA will talk about it. You know, the government of Uganda introduced uh, what we call a disability grant. Uh, that, yes, we have a category of uh, people 
that may not have the capacity you know, to participate in the labor market. So we support them with um, grants so that they are able to undertake uh, uh, apprend uh, 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 entrepreneurship business and uh, and living. Uh, you may be aware that uh, the Minister of Finance, Planning and Economic Development uh, in the last uh, week's budget speech mentioned uh, what we call cash for work. Uh, this is a new, you know, a new program in this country that if you are out there, you've been affected by COVID, this program will target you and you are unemployed. And cash for work means that you are able-bodied, you know what to do, but certainly the opportunities are limited. So th th this money, over 80 billion, you know, they have been put in this, in this program. So we'll be able to also cater for that, uh, what you'd call uh, vulnerable uh, groups. Alex, I, I want you, in, in a minute, I hear a lot about the interventions that you're talking about, but after 16 years of an education, um, and someone has to endure another year to go through apprenticeship, what are you doing about those 16 years to make them worthwhile so that the person who comes out doesn't have to get an apprenticeship to fit into the job market? Now, you, you know, uh, Raymond, this is, uh, this is technical. There are two levels of learning uh, world over. We have what we call pedagogy, uh, and uh, Professor Walenua uh, can speak uh, every about that. But we also know uh, very well that is, there is another type of learning or mode of learning which is called work-based learning. So these two complement each other. Uh, they complement each other in such a way that they are those uh, disciplines that are more of pedagogy in nature, but can be supported by work-based learning. So world over, the work-based learning is uh, taken up because of two things. One, the, the entrepreneur or an investor or a businessman or woman can mold the employee the way he, the way he wants or the way she wants and is able to inculcate what we call good behaviors, good values, good norms in this employee, besides being able to inculcate what you would call the social business skills that you know uh, we normally don't learn from classroom. So it is not about uh, the 16 years. No, the question would be, uh, the moment you enter into that bracket of uh, working age, uh, uh, working age, then it means that much as you are in a university, it doesn't stop you from learning a, uh, maybe to being an electrician. If you read The Guardian today in the UK and Wales, you get to know that actually some of the young barristers who had gone through apprenticeship are now providing services of electrician and they are earning. So the question is that these two systems, they create what we call a dynamic uh, workforce that is able to meet the demands of the, of the labor market. All right. Thank you so much, Alex, for that. We will now take a very short break, but when we return, we talk about SMEs, which are the power engine of the economy, and we also talk about the research that was commissioned by the Uganda Investment Authority in investment during the COVID-19 pandemic. Let's now take a break, but stay with us. Thank you so much for coming back with us. For those of you that have been following the conversation, we're talking about the status of investment during the COVID-19 pandemic. When we took a break, there had been a, a rebuttal that Minister Evelyn Anita wanted to make, and I want you to make that rebuttal in under two minutes so that we can move on. Yes, mm. um, it's not actually a rebuttal. It's just uh, to show how the NRM government has had a plan of addressing the economy generally, even before coronavirus. As you know, His Excellency, mm. when he took over power, he came up with a 10-point program. Mm. And one of the po points, which is point number five, is building an independent, integrated, and self-sustaining uh, national economy. But I wanted to, to give mm. a response to what has government done to address the issue that Professor raised on mm. Within two weeks, Ugandans could not feed themselves. Yes, that has been a challenge for us. And we know, and we have been saying time and again, that agriculture is the backbone of our economy. So what have we done as government? First, as government, we have had to invest over 200 million mm -hmm. to make water available for production. 
And so that mm. is irrigation. So we will be able to address the challenge and providing seedlings, we have over 300 billion just to give uh, inputs to our farmers so that together with the water for production and the seedlings, they'll be able to make food available so that Uganda can be self-sustaining and then go a step further to do the value addition mm. that I was talking about and that's why we invested that money there. And um, uh, just some other thing about skilling. Yes, we as government know that the challenge that we face in the private sector with having all the factories in place is not having the skilled labor. We have a cheap labor, it's available. We have so many young people who are not employed, but yes, Mahmoud here mm. will tell you, and he has already said, we don't have that, that labor skilled. So what mm. are we doing as government? We're, tr we're working with skilling Uganda, and now we want to link the skills that they give in skilling Uganda program to the demand of the industry, as opposed to just retooling these young people without knowing which type of factories are in the country, you have to know the needs of all the various factories. And then you can just train them specifically to be able to feel the, feed the demand of the various factories. Mm -hmm. So that is going to address that problem. But mm -hmm. away from that, the professor also mentioned something to do with import substitution not being sustainable and saying we, we can't achieve that if we don't select. Yes, Professor, actually as a government, we've taken the route of not investing or promoting all sectors of manufacturing. So we have key sectors that we know. It's about comparative advantage. So what is the comparative advantage of Uganda? We know that our soils are fertile. And so we have to promote, first of all, agribusiness. And that is a priority for us. And we're looking at our raw materials. We've done a survey. I already mentioned about agri uh, textile, which we know is labor intensive. We know we'll address two things there. We'll be able to create the jobs. On top of creating the jobs, we will be able to add mm. value and export better quality mm. products. But on the steel, we're looking at all our raw materials. I'll just give you an example of the steel product, which Pamela uh, mentioned. We export 400 million worth of raw. Uh, we import 400 mm. million of steel in this country. And yet we have steel, we have iron ore in Muko. So what have we done? We've said yes, we import all this to create shelter. Now we have to promote that iron ore in Muko, add value in the iron ore, so that we do not import goods worth 400 million in our country of steel, so that we make cheap material for our pr private people, Ugandans, to be able to construct. So we are not looking at all sectors, we are selecting. We're very selective. We only look at sectors where we have the raw material available. Then we link it up. Why did we start the mobile phone? Because we know that we have copper in Kilembe. So we are promoting the manufacturing of mobile phones because we know that the raw material is available. So we only target those that we have the raw material. The textile, like the, uh, finally, as mm. I, I give you to go on, mm. we had to promote um, the ceramics. And now we have the biggest ceramics factory in the country, and it's the biggest in the region. And why did we choose that sector? And why did we support it? It is because we have the raw material that is needed to make the ceramics, and the clay is available. And if you look at marble, we have it in excess. So we're looking uh, deliberately, our president uh, asked us to look at all our products. We have over 33 minerals, and we link them up with the products. Now, I just want to use an example of apple. Now, you'll have apple manufactured in, in, a, in, in a China, mm. but all the products of those apple phone does not come from China. So we have other advantages. The advantage we have as a country is cheap labor. We have the population, we have a hard-working population. So if that is one of the advantages that we have, we cannot get all the raw materials here. But if a manufacturer views it easy and cheaper for them to set shop here in the country, mm -hmm. so that they, because this Mahmoud will tell you, mm -hmm. they're looking at minimizing cost mm -hmm. so that they can get more profit. So if it is going to profit him that he should set a mobile phone 
or ketchup, the business that he does. Why he chose to do it in Uganda? He knows the soil is fertile. He can get the tomatoes, but he needs it to be done here. He would have gone to set shop in, uh, in Kenya, but he chose this place because he knows the demand is there. And he knows that we feed in all the other uh, mm, the cost pushers that he needs so that we make it very cheap for him to be able to make profit out of his business. Mm. All right, thank you so much, and Minister, that's very comprehensive. Um, but now I want us to look at the heartline of the economy, which is micron, small, and medium enterprises. Uh, those constitute about 75% of the economy, employed somewhere between 2.5, 4 million people. And we spoke earlier to Mrs. Winnie Lawoko about them. So I want us to play that video and then come back and we'll have a discussion on, on SMEs because we've been talking about big industry and not talking about where most of the Ugandans are. So let's have that video first. I am Winnie Lawoko Olwe, the Director of SMEs with Uganda Investment Authority. Welcome to the e-conference. Uganda Investment Authority has a mandate to facilitate, promote and grow investments, both FDIs and DDIs. In the area of domestic direct investments, we have a department which clearly looks at SMEs. It is well known world over that SMEs represent between 70 to 80 percent of employment world over. Now the Department SME of Uganda Investment Authority has two main programs which are geared towards job creation and job employment. I will start with the job creation. With job creation we look at uh, the areas of attracting, identifying and growing SMEs that can then be able to translate their investments not only into benefits of uh, doubling or, or increasing their investment volume, but also increasing the numbers of people they, promote, they employ. In this area, the things we do, uh, we support with business development services and we also do um, support them through linkages, both to um, bigger players along the value chain and also by way of connecting them to the, um, uh, to the multinational companies. The second area that we look at, which is a very critical area, is job creation. We have a program which is called Youth Apprenticeship Program. We work with universities and what we do is we identify youth, we train them to be employable, and we link them and place them within the SMEs especially in the areas of accounts uh, and financial management, in the areas of ICT, and in the areas of marketing. Now, COVID-19 has come, and indeed COVID-19 has not only impacted uh, big companies, but it has had a major impact on small and medium businesses. We know most small and medium businesses translate their investments on a daily basis, so whatever they earn today, is directly injected into the business. With this situation, it is thus critical and crucial that we rethink. COVID-19 is going to bring a new normal. And that new normal picks up on a number of things that must be done in a, in a, in a country, especially a country like Uganda. Over the weeks or the months that we have been locked down, we have realized as a country, and as has been stated by the president, and the Ministry of Finance and many other organizations that Uganda has the capacity to grow investments and to develop its economic, economic growth internally. What does that mean? That means that we need to start looking at SMEs and how they play in this role. We have reinvented ourselves. In the past, we did our work mainly through giving them capacity and skills and allowing them to practice this on their own. In the next few months, Uganda Investment Authority is going to be, the SME department is going to be looking at critical growth patterns through technical, um, technical training centers. Well, that means we take the SMEs into an environment where they can grow. Our first major product is going to be in the agricultural sector, working with a company called Protein Capital. And protein capital is looking at uh, black flies, and these black flies translated into animal feed as a substitute 
for the fish. We all know the mukene. Mukene has been the, uh, a major component in providing protein for animal feeds. We know the black ant will translate into a direct replacement, if not even with more protein. And this is a unique product that is going to help us with translating waste and waste management. What is critical for SMEs to know at this time of COVID-19? I want to talk about two key things which is critical. And for every SME, we want to look, you, we want you to look internally at your business and begin to look at the resilience within your business. What do we mean resilience? We need you to begin to look at what costs are critical and what costs can be reduced. I want to call on all SMEs to register on our profile because we are going to be tackling issues to do with re, uh, re reorganizing yourselves and actually recouping your businesses. And this can only be best done by you registering onto the UIA profile and that you, go, you get by going into www.ebs.ugandainvest.go.ug. Thank you so much for listening. Winnie Laoko for that message. Of course, we've been joined by Lawrence Biensi, who is the Acting Director General at the Uganda Investment Authority. And that's where I want us to go. Um, you've just done an impressive amount of research into the resilience of businesses, but how businesses are also handling the COVID-19 pandemic. And some of the things that, that are in that report, of course, are of key public interest. One of them is how many businesses have laid off workers, how many businesses have kept their workers but without pay, how many businesses have sustained their business continuity processes. Um, just tell us, during this research, what are the, some of the key findings that help us appreciate just how much COVID-19 has had an effect on investment? Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, and uh, viewers up there, and my colleagues who are panelists on this discussion. Uh, first of all, I want to appreciate and thank the NTV for having organized this e, uh, e conference. Uh, it is a very good opportunity for us as Uganda Investment Authority, and we do appreciate. We want to thank our minister for being part of this uh, discussion, and uh, we hope that he will be, to, he be ready to take a discussion forward because I, I do believe that uh, this is not the first and last uh, this conversation. I hope there will be more of this type uh, to see how we can get over this pandemic of COVID. Uh, just come to the point of the survey that we've done as UIA, uh, when uh, we went under lockdown, or before we went under lockdown, uh, the board decided that it was important uh, that we reach out to our clients who are the investors registered in this country. And uh, we quickly, uh, through our technical team, put up a, a questionnaire, which we knew we could only administer online. And so, uh, given the, the investors that we have registered at UIA, 7,483, we knew that we couldn't reach all of them. So what we did, we took uh, a target of 2,849 companies. And uh, that was our sample of the companies across, across all the sectors. Uh, the, the survey took only three weeks because we wanted it fast to see the impact of the of this pandemic on the business community now uh in terms of uh, where the, our respondents that we targeted were coming from uh, we targeted the entire country uh, and we covered as many sectors as possible uh, to be able to get you know the feed of how each sector is affected what were the findings very quickly, I'll run through the findings of this survey, uh, which we uh, finalized recently. <clears throat> Companies' uh, workforce was affected in different ways. And we want to report here that uh, across the, the sample size, uh, our respondents were 870 out of the 2,849 companies that we targeted, uh, giving us uh, a response rate of about 30.5, okay? And these were the findings as I want to highlight them. 
the effect on the workforce. Uh, we were told that the workers that were told to stay home because of this pandemic were 23 percent. Uh, the companies that decreased, decreased their working uh, hours uh, were 21 percent. Uh, staff who are, who are working from home, because some companies did make that arrangement uh, to enable their staff to work from home, they were 19 percent. And the staff that were temporarily laid off because uh, they could not come to work were 16 percent. We are showing that uh, as far as the labor force of the various companies was concerned, uh, it was affected in different ways. But overall, I think there was a, a, a negative impact on the workforce of, the, of these companies. Now, number two, when we looked at the, the business measures uh, that were taken by the companies uh, during this period, we found out that 56% uh, oh, of the respondents told that, that they, they had temporary closure, the six percent, and those that introduced hygiene measures in order to keep their staff uh, who introduced social distancing, hand washing, and the masks, uh, these were only twenty-five percent of the respondents, and those that adopted new methods of production uh, were only seventeen percent. Now. What were the major constraints or concerns of the businesses that we surveyed uh, during this uh, survey? Uh, concern number one was the uncertainty of the situation. Uh, companies were not sure when, of course, uh, like many uh, globally, what is happening elsewhere, uh, nobody knew when this would stop, okay? And everybody goes back to work. So the uncertainty element accounted for uh, Thirty-seven percent of the respondents that we interviewed. Number two was the loss of revenue. Those companies did tell us that they they have actually uh, lost revenue during this uh, pandemic, and twenty-two percent of those companies did emphasize that inability to serve or to service their loans which they had taken prior to the to this pandemic. Uh, 17% of the companies told us that they were unable, or they would be unable to service these loans. Then the other major issue was the closure, business closure. Uh, companies did tell us, 16% of these companies told us uh, that uh, they actually closed uh, their, their business. On employment uh, of local workers, uh, we we did uh, find out that uh, most of these companies uh, employed five to 49 employees. Those were the majority of the companies, and these were 47.6% out of the total. Companies which were employing 50 to 100 employees were only 13%. And companies that were employing above 100 employees uh, were only 17%. So they were, those you would call the big companies that we have in this country, they were employing 17%. Now, most of these uh, local workers that were affected uh, from these different companies at different levels, 61% uh, of the staff that were, that were affected were permanent employees, as compared to 31% uh, which were casual. Okay. Now, in doing this survey, uh, like any other survey, those who have done surveys in and research, uh, we found some limitations as we uh, uh, carried out this survey as an institution. We, we realized that the time, the three weeks we gave uh, for the companies to respond to the online survey uh, was probably too short uh, to get meaningful or increase the response rate. So, the survey was done in three weeks, but still we, we were able to you know, gather information from 870 companies, as I read of two earlier. The question, the questionnaire that we used, the tool that we used to carry out the survey was online, strictly online, meaning that companies that had no internet facilities uh, could not 
uh, respond to our survey. So that was another limitation that we found out. This, the survey was also, was also conducted in the midst of the lockdown. I think we started it uh, during the lockdown number one, and we, we ended it in lockdown number two. And so uh, there were a lot of uncertainties in terms of you know, people going to work, uh, people responding to such a surveys, because the, the, the thinking was quite different. UIA, the staff who are carrying out the technical team who are carrying out or mandated to carry out this exercise, uh, we're also having difficulties in terms of you know, accessing the, 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 the office. Uh, they had to be ferried by our office cars, and at times, you know, it, this caused a, a bit of, of uh, delay. And also, lastly but not least, accessibility of companies was difficult, strictly being online. Uh, I mean, staff who attempted to use phone, office phones to reach the companies uh, go to no response because majority of these staff, uh, company staff who are not in office. So uh, it ended up that it is only the online facility that was available uh, for the respondents. Lastly, but not least, which is important for us as the Uganda Investment Authority, is the what do we learn out of this? Uh, since our objective was to understand the shock that the business community had gone through during this pandemic, uh, it was important that we, we, we capture what we learned and uh, at the same time we, we come with some proposals on how to move after the post-pandemic uh, post period. As UIA, uh, we hope that uh, this will be the time uh, to uh, facilitate and help the companies that had, uh, who, who have uh, experienced uh, you know, meeting their loans, uh, rescheduling their loans with the banking, uh, uh, banking institutions. And therefore, we should be able to assist these companies uh, either re resubmit their proposal to the banks and come up with other uh, bankable projects uh, uh, going forward. And this, we hope as UIA, we, we should be able to do that. All right, thank you so much, Lawrence, for that very elaborate report from the Uganda Investment Authority. We can clearly see that the hit for the SMEs was really a very huge one and the toll. And that report, of course, will be covered in subsequent bulletins of NTV to help our viewers understand just the scope that we're dealing with. I have Professor Pamela, who is still on the call, and I wanted her to respond particularly to this SMEs question. Uh, Professor Pamela, if you're still on the call, I, I, I'd want you to just respond specifically how these SMEs can survive this, sad, this very hard time and also play a big part in the investment of the country. Uh, well, I think uh, Mr. Gens is still speaking. Set, setting up incubation centers, uh, the director SME uh, has, has just highlighted, is another important proposal that we have put forward that will be able to enhance our SME uh, constituency because it is a very important constituency as far as the economy of Uganda is concerned. So we hope that we should be able to uh, increase the workspaces, especially in our industrial parks that are scattered all over the country and to enable the, the SME uh, uh, businesses to improve. We also believe that uh, uh, ICT is going to be an enabler and very important for going forward. Uh, this has been tested. Uh, all of us who have been uh, working or partially working at home, we've realized that during this period, it is the online services that were available. And so we believe that going forward, uh, we should be able to come up with some uh, technologies that will encourage e-meetings, that will encourage uh, such a teleconferencing, like the similar one that we are holding today. Digitization is going to be very important going forward, and we believe as UIA we should be part of this process, both in the uh, promotion, but also in monitoring projects that we have, uh, that we have lances. We need to create an interactive SME portal, and I think the, 
the, the director SME has alluded to that. I I wanted Professor Pamela to respond because our time is, is pretty much running out. I want you to respond specifically to the SME's question. How can we keep them alive and also how can they play a part in the investment journey of the country? All right. The, the question was, um, what role do SMEs play in the investment journey of Uganda? But also, more specifically, they are taking a hit during this COVID-19 pandemic. How can they stay alive? How can their lights remain switched on? Thank you very much. I think that they are very central. As you are very aware, uh, most of um, the businesses um, in Uganda uh, by Ugandans, owned by Ugandans, are mostly SMEs. And as uh, data has shown, these have been mostly hit and very, and quite a number might actually not be able to um, withstand the shock. However, I think government uh, recognizes this fact, and you are aware that government has deliberately and intentionally uh, provided uh, funding in Uganda Development Bank specifically to make it possible for SMEs to borrow uh, funding uh, at low interest um, uh, uh, at, at, at a low interest rate to be able to reorganize themselves and um, uh, withstand the shock that has been occasioned uh, by COVID. Of course, it will be necessary to handhold them, handhold them in the sense that there will be need uh, on the part of uh, Uganda Development Bank, of course, in partnership um, with uh, different stakeholders to ensure that um, you know uh, business services are offered to these uh, SMEs so that they um, you know uh, be able to. Um, um, use a sort of value chain approach in understanding what are the major challenges affecting uh, their productivity. So in answer to your question, I think that uh, the issue of credit, access to low interest credit, which is the largest or the, one of the biggest challenges affecting uh, these SMEs is one area that government deliberate limitation is coming in to see that they handhold um, these SMEs to ensure that they will, they will overcome um, this, this uh, challenging time. Thank you so much. And I now want to come back into the studio, um, starting with you, Mahmoud. Um, the SME question, um, how would you address it? You work in the private sector. How would you address it? Okay. The, they are our engine to growth. And Pamela was just alluding to the issue of access to finance and cost of finance. Now, to me, the first thing I would do is to get government to get out of the money market. If government gets out of the money market, it will bring liquidity into the market. It will then force the private banks to enter the SME space. Today, the private banks have no incentive to enter the SME space because they simply will lend to government. They know government is going to pay back the T-bills on X date. So why should I bother? Why should I bother with all the administration, all the risks associated with it? The only way you can force it is for governments to get out of the money market. Mm -hmm. They've got to find an alternative way to finance their daily requirements. That'll bring the cost of borrowing down and that'll bring liquidity and force the money to enter into the, the bottom layer, into the SMEs. UDB, I don't think, will be the solution for SMEs. We've got to get the money down into the trenches. And the only way to do that is to get the private sector banks to get the appetite for risk, to get in to the into the trenches. Mm, I, I just wanted to still hold you to account on that. If, if government pulls out of the money market, Currently, we are in unique circumstances. Government doesn't have Bretton Woods institutions to go back to and get money to finance itself on a day-to-day -day basis. So in the immediate, how can SMEs 
be appetite enough? How can they reduce the risk that they have to commercial banks so that commercial banks can also play in that space? Well, you can put the appetite for risk onto government, onto BOU, and effectively turn around and do guarantee loans. So similar to what you have under ACF, the Agricultural Credit Guarantee Scheme, where government takes 50% uh, of the burden, commercial banks take 50% of the burden, broaden it to the SME category. The only way you're going to be able to get that money, the cost of funds and the availability of funds out into the SMEs is to bring the commercial banks into that space. Mm. Professor Balunya, the SME question, how would you address it? Uh, well, first of all, uh, under free market conditions, the entrepreneur doesn't fail. Businesses fail. So don't be worried. They're going to come up again. So during these conditions, some businesses have closed. They will never wake up. Others are struggling. They have to struggle and find the new where they're going to go. And definitely those who are entrepreneurs, in their right, not propped up entrepreneurs, will again emerge and they will succeed. So don't be worried about small businesses. If they are entrepreneurial, they'll still find new business elsewhere and they'll succeed. So, uh, yes, what Mahmoud is saying is distorting markets can be a problem. I earlier on talked about the role of government in the economy. These are ideological issues. Government must find its position in the market. But government should not distort market conditions. It creates a problem. Once you get interest rates below market rates, then this person you are creating will not be competitive after that money is gone away. So we must be in a position to create these institutions that can survive in the market conditions. And this is, for, so, so to me, uh, the small businesses, I'm not really worried about them. They will always fall and come up again as long as the owners are entrepreneurs. You know, and you know, markets change. I mean, right now we're looking at uh, e-marketing, we're looking at online, online, online selling. So those who are smart enough are moving away from retail shops, open shops, physical shops, to retail, to, to, to online. So they will always find a way in which they are able to succeed. So yes, uh, we see money in UDB. I don't know how much of that will be absorbed. We usually we have a problem of absorption of money that has been availed. Uh, but uh, yes, it is true that during these times, the small businesses must be handheld. Wh how to be handheld is an issue for the policymakers to determine. Mm. And uh, taxation may be one of the ways to do it mm. uh, through fiscal policy. Yeah. Monetary policy may be a bit tricky. Mm. Thank you so much. And I know that the Uganda Investment Authority actually in this survey has recommended a reduction in corporation tax, a reduction mm. in pay as you earn. But I know that Minister Evelyn Anita is itching to say that the <laughs> Ministry of Finance has been giving money or will be giving money to SMEs through EMIOGA not through the Uganda Development Bank. Is that so? Because I, I had not, an not, not only that, mm. uh, first <coughs> of all, the money that we've put in uh, UDB um, is not meant for the SMEs. We have analyzed the entire economy. And in our analysis, we thought that the money that we put in UDB is for the large-scale industries, for industrialization. But we put a separate amount of money for SMEs. First, we've put uh, 50 billion in microfinance support center for onward lending to the small enterprises, These are small and medium enterprises. Because if you walk through UDB door and asked that you wanted to borrow a one million or 100 million, they will not give it to you because that is very, very low. So they place where you can get access to 100 million or 1 million, which is now this small enterprise, is the microfinance support center. For that, as government, we've put the 50 billion. And away from the 50 billion, we know that those are now for those other small and medium businesses. But we've gone further to analyze the economy 
and said, we have the bulk of the population. Professor here knows better that every year we graduate over 700,000 young people. And they've started their businesses. Oftentimes, their businesses do not require a lot of money, uh, close to 500,000. So this cannot go to UDB. And as government, we recognize that. And we've put our ultimate goal is to invest 150 billion just for those young people who are into carpentry business, women small groups that they want to sell their Kabbalah Gala. But you know, the money they need is not 100 billion that they have to go and get from UDB. For that, we've invested 70 billion in this financial year's budget. So we have segmented it. And I just thought I should also use this opportunity to answer what uh, uh, Mr. Mahmoud here said, that government has to get out of the money or the market or mar money b economy. Mm. Now, yes, and I'll tie it with what Professor Bellunia said, uh, that you have to be careful about the interest rates. And Prof Mahmoud, Mr. Mahmoud is saying, yes, uh, commercial banks have to be given the opportunity to lend out money. We, as the players and the managers of the economy, we looked at the commercial banks and analyzed what, how they're giving. A commercial bank's interest rate is so high. Sometimes it's 25 to 30% interest rates. And the tenure they give for you to access this loan is really so short. So making it very difficult for a manufacturer to be able to grow his manufacturing sector. So why did we then brought and in decide to invest in UDB? We invested in UDB to address two issues. Make money cheap, the interest rates have to be cheap. Secondly, give long tenure of borrowing. Now, if you give someone a grace period of five years and repayment period of 13 years, that is sufficient for a manufacturer to be able to grow. And we didn't get these figures out of blue. Just to answer what Professor has raised, we didn't get it out of blue. We benchmarked it against our inflation rate. So our inflation right now stands at 7%. Now, that's why we look at on lending rates, interest rates between 12, between 10 to 12%, so that mm. we do not affect. Mm. Yes, mm. the bank yeah. rate. So, yeah. so that still is safer, right? Yeah. So we will not be able to uh, distort the economy. And for us, what we want to address is the question that Mahmoud, Mr. Mahmoud raises all the time, mm -hmm. access to cheap credit, access to cheap electricity, access to market. So what did we do as government to address the question, which is the third concern of Mr. Mahmoud of market, is negotiate markets, the East African market, the commercial market, and we've negotiated the US market and the Europe market. And we have these uh, bilateral agreements for us to export our products to those markets. Mm. All right, thank you so much, Anita. I, I, we have a, a phone line running where you can call us. We'll be able to take about one or two phone calls. But for now, I want us to go to Dr. Andrew Gulova, who is from the Director for Planning in the National Planning Authority. And we want to talk about particularly the issue of access to finance for SMEs and for big business. Um, as a planning authority, where do you see the economy in the five, ten years, and this long tenure lending that government is taking. As a planning authority, what do you make of it? So Dr. Andrew Gulova, as you answer that, the phone lines will be running. If you have a question, you can call in. Uh, Raymond, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Raymond. Uh, I think the issue of uh, private sector for us in uh, development planning is very key. I'll give you a few facts. One is that uh, private sector uh, employs 77 percent of all the formal sector jobs. One. Secondly, it contributes to 80 percent of the entire tax revenue that we, that we get. Third is that uh, if you look at it a bit more, uh, 80 percent of the investments that we have in this country are contributed to by the private sector. Another fact. The second fact is that this private sector is largely dominated by SMEs. And SMEs contribute to 1.1 million of all the private sector and they employ about 25 million, uh, uh, 2.5 million Ugandans. 
But what has happened with, with this COVID is that this is the largest heat sector and the bigger problem these, these MSMEs have had even before COVID was, was mainly uh, the cost of access and the cost of financing, as you have put it. Uh, the, the logistics in terms of registering their businesses has been a challenge and this is an area that I've told us we need to deal with and issues related to connecting water and electricity. That said, uh, most of them, for them to formalize patrol doors in the informal sector, require incentives. And the incentives they require beyond just for tax purposes. They require incentives in terms of cheap credit. And uh, this is where government is, is going into. The NDP has uh, elaborated what needs to be done in terms of, of uh, affording them, one, longer term and affordable credit. And like the Honorable Minister has uh, rightly put it, uh, is the one way to go, uh, purchase starting with this budget, is recapitalizing U U Uganda Development Bank. But there are other options that also government is trying to look at. In particular, with the, the micro, uh, medium, uh, sm small and the medium enterprises, uh, government is going deliberately to focus on uh, microfinance support center so that it's able to, to be able to handhold these SMEs. But in addition to credit, uh, what government is doing under private sector is to, to develop the development, uh, the business development services for, for the private sector. What do I mean here? Is that uh, Ugandans are uh, an entrepreneurial country, but the risk of them, many startups come up, the risk at 38% for every 141 businesses that are created is too high. So what we are suggesting here is that we need to get ways of handholding these uh, uh, MSMEs, so that if the, somebody starts up and he has a good idea, we don't just wait for that idea for him to come for credit. We look for those ideas where they are. Instead of us sitting in our offices and waiting for them, we look for them where they are and uh, we're able to support them. Uh, we, we give them incentives if they are to formalize. We, we talk to them on the benefits on registration so that they're able to work with us and this is where the role of the private sector and government will come in and partner and work together. Also to answer almost what uh, Professor Varunio was talking about is that uh, the role of government here will not only be to come into the policy space of, of the markets, but is to come into the place where the markets are failing to, to move in. The good example that we look at here in terms of NDP and the future of Uganda in general, if you look at uh, the, the trade corridor of Uganda, the trade code of Uganda is mainly on the southern side, starting from Malaba uh, all the way to Katuna. And what NDP is proposing to be able to embark is to diversify this trade corridor. Instead of it being a straight line from Malaba to Katuna, we, we are proposing to have a triangle. And this triangle should be coming from Malaba uh, all the way to, to, to the northern Uganda through the, the, the Karamoja corridor so that we harness the minerals that are that side then it comes down all the way to, to Kavare uh, through the oil region so that you have a triangle. And the reason we are trying to force this, and this is where the private sector and investments are going to, to come in, is to have a balanced growth. And the, if the industrial parks that we are proposing are along this triangle. And what government needs to do beyond credit and financing is to put in the conducive atmosphere, to build the right roads, to do the, the right rail, to put in the logistics that can entice the private sector, not only to develop in the triangle where they were now, but to diversify it into that triangle, particularly leveraging the resources that we have in terms of minerals. A, an example I would give here is that if you notice, uh, uh, Karamoja region has uh, enough limestone and cheap limestone, but currently, because we hadn't, as government, we hadn't developed the right power line, most factories actually using trucks to pick those stones in order to develop cement in other regions of the country, uh, particularly in Tororo and even Kampala cement uses the same model. So what we are doing in terms of putting that conducive uh, environment is what can government do in terms of taking the right electricity, increasing the electricity that is required for us to have industries in Karamoja to, in order to be able to tap into that uh, uh, limestone. It's the same conversation we are having uh, in the NDP on in the side of iron ore is in terms of 
uh, enticing farms and being able to explore uh, the iron ore. We have, we have done a study and we realized that within the valve chain of iron ore, the missing link is mainly uh, smelting the iron ore that we are having in order to link it up to the value chain of it being used to produce the metal that we require. So in terms of that, we, we, have, we are having proposals and UDB is a key player in which it can partner with the private sector that is existing in that area. We have two factories that are, could be able to be scaled up in, in terms of iron smelting, that is tembo and steel rolling. And we, have, we believe with cheap credit, that capacity can be used in order to, prop, to use iron ore to be able to drive the, the construction industry, to be able to drive uh, most of the manufacturing industry, and to be able to, to drive job creation, and to be able to utilize the good iron ore that we have already in the country. So that's the thinking, combining both the private and the government in terms of the quasi-market approach to be able to the strength of each. The private sector will always be the driver of growth, uh, but government, there are some areas, if you left the private sector to go alone, the, it will never go. And the example I've given you is that if you, because we left the private sector to go, we realize that the growth corridor has been biased towards one side, one line in the country, around, around Lake Victoria, from Malaba all the way to Katuna border. So we think that if government did its underlying role, then to be able to entice the private sector to go in areas where it wouldn't have even gone. Mm. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Gulova, for that. That's a really uh, impressive submission. And what comes through now, this is now, I must act like a government in this free market. I'm <laughs> going to give each of you one minute each, and I hope that you stick to it so that I don't have to pull out uh, all the stops to get you. So three things emerge, uh, skills, which you talked about, credit, which he talked about, and business continuity processes, which Professor talked about. In parting shots, what will happen now moving forward for these three things to be guaranteed so that the investment climate of the country remains stable? And I'll start with you, Professor, then we'll end with you. Well, and in skilling, of course, uh, we need to reform the education sector. We need to bring skills a little lower. It used to happen in this country. We must be able to um, look at skilling. The, the temporary measures which are in place are fine but we must now incorporate in the education system and put more emphasis on science education. Uh, business continuity, people are going to pick up from where they start, from where they, they feel uh, this way start. And there's a big loss that many companies have incurred that must be recognized and companies must go on. And this is where government must be able to support, as the minister was saying, what are those areas which you must support you in? Mm -hmm. I, I'll, I'll leave my mood right with the yeah. other issues. I will start with business continuity. We've taken a hit in COVID, either supply chain disruptions, demand uh, disruptions. But again, I go back to the issue of resilience. And I think if we have the ability to access the finance, we will shift. We will shift in the method we do business and we will shift in how we do business. And at the end of the day, I think, all right, COVID for me was good because for the first month, all I did was really rethink what am I doing in terms of business? How should I be doing business differently? I reduced staff by about 250 odd workers, but I increased my R&D budget. And now post COVID, I actually see I will even go beyond the 250 if the R&D comes into fruition. So it goes back to the skilling side. I'm doing the R&D, but when I have the products that I can launch out, will I have the people that can implement? This mm. is going to be the key question. Mm. All right, Ms. Evelyn. Yes, I want to thank the Professor because he summarized it very well. Mm. That yes, the manufacturing sector or the small and medium enterprises will actually rebound. They will grow and pick up from there where they stopped. Mm -hmm. And so that brought an analogy in my mind that really, as a country, this is not the first pandemic that we are facing. We had the LRA virus, <laughs> the Lord's Resistant Virus, Conflict. that hit <laughs> yes. northern Uganda mm. for 20 years. Those are two decades. Who would have thought that 10 years later, 
actually going to get electricity coming out of northern Uganda from Karuma. <laughs> Who would have thought that northern Uganda will become a food basket of the country? So the people of northern Uganda, having recovered from a more dangerous pandemic, the whole world said they will not recover. And they worked so hard, His Excellency the President invested a lot of energy and time to ensure that that part of Uganda recovers. And yes, it recovered from that pandemic. Mm. People lost lives, nobody could cultivate. But if you go to northern Uganda, now we're going to get electricity coming out of northern Uganda to supply the whole of the, of the country. We're now having agriculture. Most people actually do this agribusiness we talk about. is booming in northern Uganda. So if Uganda could be able to, under the leadership of President Museveni, be able to recover from this pandemic of Lord's resistant mm -hmm. movement, why wouldn't we recover from the pandemic of coronavirus, which is not as bad or worse than the Lord's mm. resistant movement, mm. where you could not even breathe, you could not talk about cultivation, because if you went to the gardens, you'll be hit by landmines. But here, with this pandemic of coronavirus, you can still go to the garden mm. and do it in self-isolation, uh, rather in, uh, in the following the SOPs and continue doing business. Yes, mm. my closing remarks is, this is a temporary pro uh, problem. We will recover, we will mm. rebound, we still have the leaders who got us to northern Uganda to recover from mm. the pandemic of Lord's resistance, still mm. in place, His Excellency Eric Agutam Seven, mm. with the guidance that's and leadership that he's putting in place for us to handle this coronavirus, mm. with all the stimulus that we have put to support the economy. I can assure you the Ugandan's economy mm. is going to bounce back yet better than it was. All right, thank you so much, Evelyn. And thank you so much to all of you who've been watching us. This has been the e-conference for the Ghana Investment Authority, talking about the status of investment in the country. Thank you so much for those of you who have joined us on social media, those who joined the Zoom call. We will be relaying some of your feedback. This conversation continues online. But for now, let me switch you back to our normal programming at NTV. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.